Hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about Rubisco. We'll talk about all the unique features of this very abundant enzyme. And then we'll talk about how it can lead to an overall decrease in sugar production in the Calvin cycle. In the previous video modules, I talked about the carboxylation phase of the Calvin cycle and how important Rubisco was in the merger of RUBP and CO2 molecules. But we didn't go in depth in talking about Rubisco and all of its special features. So I just want to remind you that looking at its name, ribulose 1,5-biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, that is a mouthful and I'm glad that the short name for it is Rubisco. But today we'll talk about why the name is so important and how it can be used to describe its role during any kind of environmental scenario. And just as a reminder, when we merged RUBP with CO2, we got this six carbon compound, this intermediate here. And again, that immediately splits into two three carbon compounds, one and two, and they are both three PGs. So today, as we go through this video module, we'll see how when Rubisco is going to act a certain way, how these two 3PGs might be different than what we've talked about before. Here is a very basic illustration of Rubisco. It tends to have kind of this cube shape to it, and it consists of eight active sites. An active site meaning that's where the cool binding is going to happen. In this particular case, Rubisco binding with CO2. So here's an active site. Here's another one. These other two. Here's another one. And there are two that we can't see that are on the back side of this particular Rubisco enzyme. So eight active sites. That kind of seems like a lot, right? And it is. But there are a couple of features about Rubisco that are important to go over. One is that it is actually kind of slow relative to other enzymes in that it is because it has been estimated that each active site catalyzes just three reactions per second, while other enzymes that we know about are much faster. They can actually catalyze thousands of reactions per second. And today we'll talk about its biggest flaw and how that leads to incredibly inefficient photosynthesis. So why is Rubisco so inefficient? Well, let's take a look at the name for a second. Ribulose 1,5-biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. And I think the two key aspects of the name here is going to be this carboxylase and oxygenase. What that means is that Rubisco can be kind of multifunctional. It can fix CO2 and act as a carboxylase, but it can also fix oxygen and act as an oxygenase. So it has this dual role and whether it acts as a carboxylase or oxygenase depends heavily on the type of environment that the plant is in. So this is really a game changer in terms of thinking about how efficient Rubisco can possibly be during photosynthesis. And that's because oxygen and CO2 compete with each other for each active site in the Rubisco enzyme. So who wins out? That kind of depends on the environmental scenario at hand. So let's walk through one particular environmental scenario. So we have just one enzyme shown in this diagram here, but let's pretend that that is inside a leaf. And that we also have our gatekeepers here, stomatopores, and those are open as you can see. And when the stomatopores are open, we can actually get diffusion of gases in and outside of the leaf. We naturally have a ton of CO2 molecules hanging out in the environment like this. And because of that, it has set up a gradient. So we have a lot more CO2 hanging around in the atmosphere outside of the leaf. And because of that gradient, they want to move inside the leaf. And as we know, uh, with the gatekeepers of the stomatopores, that when we get the byproduct of oxygen during photosynthesis,
that those are in high concentration inside the leaf and that will in fact diffuse out. So what happens when the stomatopores are open is that we tend to get a lot of CO2 molecules diffusing inside the leaf. And yes, we have some oxygen kind of hanging out in there as well, again, because of the byproducts of photosynthesis. But the vast majority of the molecules that Rubisco is going to run into will, in fact, be CO2. And that's a good thing. Rubisco actually has a high affinity for CO2, so it will easily bind to CO2, probably a little bit better than oxygen. And now that we have this environment inside the leaf where we have a lot more CO2 than oxygen, then Rubisco is going to act more like a carboxylase because it is binding with CO2. So let's change the scenario a little bit. Let's look at this normal environmental scenario where the stomatal pores are open, oxygen is diffusing out, and the blue CO2 molecules are diffusing in. What if we put a stop to it? And what if the stomatal pores started to close? Well, we would see that the diffusion would stop, so we wouldn't get diffusion of any molecules in either direction. And we'd end up with a scenario where Rubisco only had to deal with what was inside the leaf at this particular moment, meaning that with the stomatal pores closed, it will just start to use up all of the blue CO2 molecules until it is left with only the oxygen. And because the stomatopores were closed, we then also got this big buildup of oxygen inside the leaf. Again, because those are the byproducts of photosynthesis, but they had nowhere to go, so they ended up concentrating in high amounts inside the leaf. So this particular scenario led Rubisco no choice but to act as an oxygenase and only fix oxygen. So let's take a moment here to pause and think about what kind of environmental scenario would need to take place in order for Rubisco to only act as an oxygenase. So press pause and think about this for a minute. So now that you've taken a moment to think about what kind of environmental scenario would lead to Rubisco acting like an oxygenase, if you were like me, then you probably thought about water. So I would guess that low water would lead to this scenario. I would also guess that high temperatures would also lead to the scenario. So anything that really creates a stressed out environment for the plant, leading the stomatopores to close and therefore getting this big buildup of oxygen inside the leaf gives Rubisco no choice but to act as an oxygenase. So what does this all mean in the grand picture of overall photosynthetic rate. So when Rubisco is going to act as an oxygenase and fix oxygen instead of CO2, we get a different intermediate that gets formed. So recall that if it was fixing CO2, that we would get a six carbon compound. But instead, because it is fixing oxygen, we get instead a five carbon compound intermediate. This still is unstable and will immediately split just like we've seen before. But what we end up with instead is a regular 3PG, which we've seen before. And again, because we're only dealing with five carbons in total with the merger of RUBP and an oxygen, we get instead of a second 3PG, we get something entirely new, this two carbon compound called 2-phosphoglycolate. And what ends up happening with these two products here is that the regular 3PG will in fact go on through the reduction phase. Now what happens with the 2-phosphoglycolate? Well, it cannot enter the Calvin cycle and it in fact goes off into its own process. As it moves to other locations in the cell, it will do all of this to create a regular 3PG in the end. And this 3PG that ultimately gets created will go back into the Calvin cycle like we normally would have seen. So basically what ends up happening is that this phosphoglycolate just takes this tangential process and uses up an ATP and 
it actually releases CO2 in the same process. And so it actually becomes quite wasteful. And when we think about all of this taken together, this is called photorespiration. And this is because rather than Rubisco fixing CO2, it had no choice but to consume oxygen. And in this process, the product is going to be a release of CO2 because of this phosphoglycolate having to take this tangent over here before it becomes a regular 3PG. So it's almost like by taking this tan tangent here that it's kind of like undoing photosynthesis. It's like the opposite of photosynthesis. Rather than fixing CO2, it's releasing CO2. And so overall, we end up getting just a reduction in the efficiency of Rubisco as well as an overall reduction in the amount of sugar that is produced. And that is the ultimate problem with Rubisco. That's it for today's module. Your main takeaway should be that Rubisco, while really important in the Calvin cycle, can have dual roles and that one role could be really efficient when it's acting like a carboxylase and in the other role, when it's acting like an oxygenase, it can lead to major inefficiencies in the Calvin cycle and ultimately lead to a process known as photorespiration. And when this happens, we have an overall decrease in sugar production.